Hey folks, it's Dr. Gilchrist. So the last time that we were here uh, in lecture 34, we were talking about some of the major biological and physiological changes that happen to the brain and the rest of the central nervous system with healthy aging. Now, as you can expect, um, these brain-related changes, particularly in the frontal lobe, will lead um, to some different types of deficits. So as we kind of saw in the last lecture, you can experience some atrophy to the frontal lobe and also to the hippocampus. And so this is going to lead to a variety of different types of cognitive deficits that we're going to talk about today. We will also begin our discussion of Alzheimer's disease. And if this is a particularly difficult topic for you uh, to hear about. Um, I would mention take some breaks when you need to in this lecture if you find that it's going to be hard. So one of the first things that we know about how cognition changes with age is that by and large, memory tends to change. So a couple of different things that we tend to find that tend to be impaired with age, um, that includes impaired episodic memory, so memory for events. We also tend to find that working memory or short-term memory is also impaired. Um, so typically I've done research with uh, older adults and young adults uh, looking either at lists of words that they immediately have to remember or having them try to remember uh, different types of colored squares. And what we tend to find is that by and large working memory does decline with older age. Um, so whereas as for young adults, for visual working memory, they can remember about four items pretty well. For older adults, it's usually closer to about two. Um, we do also see um, increased time for older adults to complete tasks. This is what is sometimes referred to as cognitive slowing. Um, one of the ways that you can actually test this is with something called the digit symbol task. So basically what you do, uh, you're presented with these different pictures of symbols, and each of them is tied to a certain digit 0 through 9 or 1 through 9. And you're basically given a long, long line of these symbols, and you have to fill out the corresponding digit. Um, anytime that you want, you can look up to the top of the page and remember what digit goes with what symbol. But ideally, the more you do it, the more you should have an idea of which one is one, which one is two, which one is three. And uh, what we tend to find is that older adults, uh, they take longer to finish. They also take more glances at the key to help them as they do this task. Um, now, we do know that not everything is impaired with age. Um, so semantic memory, memory for facts, um, tends to be intact. And in some cases, um, some studies have actually shown that semantic memory in older adults is better than that for young adults. And that's partially because older adults have lived longer, they've learned more things, uh, they have more experience with facts. We do also know that non-declarative uh, memory is also intact. So older adults can still demonstrate uh, demonstrate priming, and they do also do fine on skills like mirror drawing. So generally, this is going to fit with the regions that tend to be most affected with older adults, especially those frontal regions. Um, the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobe are affected, but they don't look like how they look in people that have amnesia. Um, additionally, we did see that uh, basal ganglia atrophy. We do know that the basal ganglia... Um, does show a little bit of loss of volume, but by and large, it tends to be intact. And the basal ganglia has been implicated in things like implicit learning and learning new motor skills. So again, um, part of the reason that we might, might see some of these changes in cognition could be due to that frontal atrophy. Um, now, here's kind of some additional evidence that we have. So this is taken from neuroimaging. Um, so typically we tend to find in most working memory and episodic memory tasks, 
We tend to find that relative to older adults, frontal activity in young adults is by and large enhanced, and it's enhanced relative to their resting state as well. So when you're doing tasks that really require episodic memory or working memory, you're going to see more frontal activity. However, we don't really see that with older adults, and that might potentially explain the poor performance that we see. Now, for a semantic memory test, oftentimes we test this by things like vocabulary. So if you'd like to test yourself, go ahead and pause the video after I give you these three words to define. Define the word dogma. Define the word village. And define the word melancholy. If you'd like to pause that now to test your own semantic memory, feel free. Okay. So we do tend to find that relative to young adults, older adults tend to be more accurate and detailed in their definitions when they're given these kind of tests. And this is because the semantic memory networks are largely unaffected. There is a wide distribution of um, semantic memory throughout the brain, uh, and that includes uh, knowledge of verbal information or word meanings. And these are basically distributed throughout the frontal lobes, the temporal lobes, and the parietal lobes too. So they're not just in one region, so they're generally spared from this atrophy by virtue of its distribution. Now, I've done a lot of work with aging over the years, and one of the things that becomes very, very clear is that you have to treat your older participants differently than you would treat your younger participants. And so if you are interested in doing studies that look at cognitive aging, here are a few different things that you need to consider. So one of the first big things that we have to talk about here is that there are a lot of stereotypes about aging and memory performance. Um, probably one of the best examples of this is the, uh, the Simpsons. You have Grandpa Simpson who says ridiculous things and forgets what he was saying. So the family dog takes his food and he goes, that raccoon stole my lamb chop. He crashes into an aquarium and asks if it's the Dairy Queen as a killer whale is on top of his car. So there are a lot of these stereotypes that as you get older, you're going to be really forgetful and you don't really know that much. And we have a tendency to really infantilize the elderly, as especially here in the Western Hemisphere. Um, so I know from my personal experience that when I've looked at studies with older adults, they go, oh, you look at memory. Oh, you don't want to test me. I'm terrible. And this has led to some really interesting things. So for example, uh, when we tell older adults about the kind of studies that we do, um, one of the things that we try not to do is talk about the word memory or talk about memory test. We'll say we're looking in changes in cognition throughout the lifespan. Um, so we have these stereotypes and it's a very common phenomenon um, in social psychology fields to talk about stereotype threat. So stereotype threat is basically the idea that you're aware of a stereotype about a demographic or a group to which you belong. And knowledge of that stereotype and situations that potentially activate that stereotype um, trigger anxiety. And what ends up happening is you basically have a self-fulfilling prophecy. You go in to take a memory experiment, you're worried about your memory, you're worried about the stereotype that older adults have worse memory, and as a result, because of your worry, you end up doing worse on the memory test. And unfortunately, we can't tease apart whether it's because of your worse memory or if it's because of stereotype threat. So you have to be very, very careful talking to older adults about the kind of studies that you do, because even just telling them that they're going to be doing a memory test can really stress them out. Out. The experimental setting can induce a stereotype threat. A lot of older adults have not been in this kind of a situation since college. 
or even high school in certain cases. And whereas taking a test is not a fun thing for you, but you can manage it, a test for an older adult can be really scary because they haven't done it in a while. Oftentimes, these experiments are being run by college undergraduates or graduate students who tend to be in their 20s, and that may induce a stereotype threat. Generally, we know that our attitude may affect performance. Generally, if a person thinks their memory is going to be bad, they tend to create a self-fulfilling prophecy. There are a couple of other um, contextual effects that we know about. Um, In particular, the time of day that you test an older adult really matters. Um, So generally, uh, when I was working in a cognitive aging lab in graduate school, older adults tend to do better earlier in the morning. And so unfortunately for my 22, 23-year-old self, that meant getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning, running all the way to campus, and making coffee for the older adults who were going to be at the experiment at 7.30 in the morning. And that's really early for young adult. But that's when older adults tend to do their best. Um, Likewise, uh, when I was working at Georgia Tech, we very rarely ran um, older participants after noon. Because not only do we have time of day effects, but If they're out of there by 2 o'clock, they're hitting Atlanta rush hour, and some of them might have been nervous about driving in rush hour traffic. Now, in contrast, young adults tend to do better in the early afternoon. And we do find that if you focus on when different age groups are going to do their best, rather than making everybody come at the exact same time, we're going to find those age differences are reduced. Additionally, we are going to talk a little bit about the testing material that matters. Um, Older adults tend to have enhanced memory for positive events, whereas young adults, as we've seen, um, and uh, tend to have a better memory for negative events or negative stimuli. So let's get back to those time of day effects. So for example, you're looking at the total number of list intrusions. So people are given uh, three different lists. So this is basically a metric of how many mistakes they make. So here we've got our younger adults in white, we've got our older adults in dark. And what we tend to find, so for our young adults, they tend to do a little worse in the morning, they tend to do better in the afternoon. Compare that to our older adults, generally their memory performance is worse, but it's less worse in the morning and it's significantly worse in the afternoon. So when you're trying to schedule older adults for your research, Be prepared for the possibility that you want to run them in the morning when their memory performance tends to be better. Run older adult or run young adults in the afternoon when their memory tends to be better. Let's talk a little bit more about that positivity effect. So thanks to the operations of our amygdala, we know that negative stimuli and memory for negative things tends to be enhanced. So young adults tend to attend to uh, negative information. They pay more attention to it. It sticks more. But uh, Mara Mather and colleagues have basically found that that does not happen for older adults. There is not that enhancement for uh, negative events. Rather, older adults pay more attention to and remember more positive information. And there are a couple of different theories as to why older adults remember more positive information. And to go over all of that, well, we wouldn't have time for that. But I think it's important to note that this positivity bias does exist. Be prepared for that if you are looking at emotional or presenting people with emotional stimuli, such as this study by Mather and Knight. So what they basically did is they presented um, young and older adults with items um, with items to basically study. So they would be shown different pictures, such as this rolling pin, and they would be asked to make a certain type of judgment. They would either have to judge how common the object was. It's a rolling pin. It's pretty common. They view it for three uh, three seconds. And then they get another one. This is a cat wearing a 
kitten wearing cute frog hat, and you basically have to judge whether the item is indoors or not. Now, what's really important here is that, um, and this is a really positive image. It's super cute. Um, one thing that I really want to note, these re the participants are not being told that it's a memory test. They are being told, you're just going to view these different pictures and make judgments about them. So they're not deliberately being told that it's a memory test. So we want to, I, I think that's a very good design because remember, we don't want to trigger that stereotype threat. And additionally, this type of test is what is known as an incidental memory test. That means that the goal is not to necessarily try to remember these for later. Um, we're just going to give you a memory test after the fact, even though we didn't necessarily tell you you had to remember these later. So they study these items and then they make judgments and then they get a surprise memory test. So they weren't expecting to have to remember these items for later. Um, and what they have to do, they are basically presented with an item and they basically have to identify if it's old or new. Now, they also have to identify the type of judgment that they made. Did they make a common judgment on how common it was? Uh, a judgment as to whether it's indoors or they don't remember. So they have these three options if they know they've seen it before. If they didn't, they're going to say it's new. Now, we know we've seen this before, and the correct answer is it's an indoor judgment. Here's a tarantula. We didn't see that before, so it's new. So what did they end up finding? So here's the proportion of recall from zero to one in terms of proportion. Higher numbers mean more accurate performance. So our older adults, here's negative stimuli. And you can see that their performance for that is worse than their performance for positive stimuli. The effect is reversed in young adults. They have better memory for negative stimuli and worse memory for positive stimuli. So keep that in mind if you are presenting emotionally coded materials to older and younger participants. So that's all I have for uh, cognitive aging in general. Now we're going to start talking about dementia. So probably the best known type of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. Um, this was originally discovered um, by the German psychiatrist Alois Alzheimer in 1906, where the dementia gets its name. Um, his patient, the first known case of Alzheimer's disease, was a female patient, Auguste, uh, and, and she was basically in her early 50s and was reported as being uh, demented. Um, and in particular, um, what was far more interesting to Alzheimer um, beyond the behavioral changes is what happened to the brain. Um, so he was able to stain brain tissue with a new stain, and um, the post-mortem stain showed a very thin cortex with plaques and um, tangles that were within the neurons itself. Um, and he called it pre-senile dementia. Now, the definition of Alzheimer's disease has changed a lot over the past 100 years. Um, today, we refer to dementia in any aged person with behavioral and neural symptoms as Alzheimer's disease. And if it occurs before age 65, we consider that early onset. Um, now, I want to be very clear. There were definitely cases of Alzheimer's disease before 1906, but this is really the first time that this particular set of symptoms was described. It is very, very common today and unfortunately getting more common. So what are the different behavioral and physiological signs of Alzheimer's disease? So Alzheimer's disease is a progressive neurodegenerative disease. It is the most common type of dementia. Uh, generally, if you are diagnosed with dementia, you are probably going to start with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease unless you show slightly different signs as with something like Lewy body dementia or with frontotemporal dementia. So it's basically about 50 to 80% of all cases of dementia. 
Now, the first main symptom that you are going to see with Alzheimer's disease is an anterograde memory loss. So I'm going to be referring to a lot of examples with my grandmother to kind of explain this loss and what it kind of looks like. So initially, one of the first things that I noticed about my grandmother was definitely the anterograde loss. So I had just graduated from college, I was going on to graduate school, and I would call occasionally, and she would ask me, oh, when are you coming home? And I'd say, Oh, well, I'm coming home at Thanksgiving. And then about five minutes later, she'd go, well, when are you coming home? And early on, she'd be like, oh, yeah, that's right. You told me Thanksgiving. But eventually, she would forget that I'd already told her. And so every five minutes, it would be, when are you coming home? When are you coming home? Then it would be uh, maybe several months later, it'd be every two minutes or every three minutes. So she wasn't able to form those new long-term memories. And as we're gonna see, that's because the first place that really atrophies in Alzheimer's disease is the hippocampus. Um, after that anterograde memory loss, there is going to be a progressing retrograde memory loss. It's generally going to operate the last memories that you made are going to be the first to go. So older memories are going to stick around for a little while longer, but eventually they will be lost too. You will also see semantic memory loss, poor judgment, confusion, restlessness, mood swings, um, and things like that. And that's largely going to happen because after the hippocampal atrophy, you will get overall global cortical atrophy. Um, eventually, this will destroy cognition, personality, the ability to function. Um, very close to the end of my grandmother's life, she was not able to really move herself. She had to be moved. Um, and things like that. Um, she was not necessarily able to speak. Um, and in certain cases, uh, some people with Alzheimer's disease, this atrophy can go on for so long that they actually end up losing the ability to swallow. So how do we get a diagnosis? This is a really contentious issue. My grandmother had an Officialish diagnosis of Alzheimer's in 2005, but it's entirely possible based on what I've heard from my mother and my aunt that she started showing signs long before that. Um, the criteria for diagnosing Alzheimer's disease is changing all the time, and it actually changed as recently as 2007. Up until very recently, diagnosis in a live person was unthinkable. Um, at that point, the gold standard was and still is looking at a post-mortem brain. And part of the reason for that is because Alzheimer's looks like a lot of other types of dementias if you're just looking at behavior. You also have to look at the anatomy of what's going on inside the brain. You have to see those plaques and those tangles. Now, how Alzheimer's disease typically first presents is a mild form of preclinical dementia called mild cognitive impairment. My grandfather was briefly um, diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment before it progressed to, yeah, he's definitely got dementia. So how this will typically start is a patient or somebody related to the patient will visit a memory clinic. Uh, there will be complaints about memory and forgetfulness. Um, there may be some executive impairments. There might be some difficulty planning, switching between different types of tasks or thoughts, attention, forgetting to pay bills, things like that. And what's really critical is you have to notice this deterioration over time. Um, now, this will look like healthy aging. Memory loss during aging is normal, but there's a difference between healthy aging and mild cognitive impairment or healthy aging and Alzheimer's disease. Um, typically, what we will find is that they will show lower performance on standardized tests. Now, some patients may remain at this stage. Others, like my grandfather, will progress into full-blown Alzheimer's disease. Um, mild cognitive impairment is not specific to Alzheimer's disease. 
We have numerous long-term studies that are being conducted on mild cognitive impairment patients. We're following them and assessing their changes. They get a lot of scans, blood work, genetic testing, but there's not really a lot of treatment unless they are currently a part of some sort of clinical trial. So what kind of standardized tests would we be looking at to make a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment? Um, well, there are a couple of different things. Um, oftentimes, these tests are going to include uh, things like declarative memory and also working memory. A very common uh, test for dementia is something called the mini mental state exam. And this has a lot of different components like following directions, remembering something that you read at the beginning of the test, things like that. Um, but generally, we're going to see tests of declarative memory. We're going to read lists of words and test recall at various delays. So we'll look at immediate recall. Then we'll look at de delayed recall in like two minutes and then maybe follow up 15 minutes later. Uh, word definitions is a measure of semantic memory or asking people to draw pictures from memory. For working memory, you'll be given a list of digits and you'll be asked to remember them, maybe repeat them forward or put them in backward order. Now, in general, with these, older adults do do worse on these than young adults do, but mild cognitive impairment patients will perform worse than older adults with healthy aging for one or for all of these tests. Now, if a person is more severe than the mild cognitive impairment state, or if they've progressed from mild cognitive impairment to a more advanced state, they might be like my grandmother and grandfather and be given a probable diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And this is probable because it's generally not possible to diagnose Alzheimer's disease until you have a post-mortem brain and you can actually look at the microstructure. Now, this is starting to change because neuroimaging has become better able to identify the pathology of Alzheimer's disease that is typically too small to see on a standard MRI scan. Now, all of the dementias can have similar cognitive changes, um, but up until recently, most dementias were characterized as probable Alzheimer's disease because Alzheimer's disease, at least as far as we know right now, is the most common dementia. So here's the criteria for a probable diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Uh, six months or more of episodic memory decline that includes both subjective evidence from the person who is suffering from it, as well as objective evidence from family, friends, employees, and so on. It must affect daily life, like the inability of somebody to pay bills, run errands, do work, or things like that. Um, you will see impairment in at least one other cognitive domain, such as language abilities, working memory abilities, spatial learning, and so on. And it can't be due to another cause like stroke, diabetes, or depression. Um, this probable diagnosis has about 60 to 80% accuracy, so it's not terrible. Um, as of 2007, confirmation from MRI or PET scans can also be used. So what sort of things can we potentially see in a probable diagnosis or mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease beyond the memory issues? You may also see a disorientation. Um, they're typically lost in space and time. They present with confusion and panic. Uh, in the case of my grandfather, uh, we actually ended up moving him uh, and my grandmother to an assisted living facility last summer. It's a really cool place. There's like six people. So he's not in a big nursing home. He gets quality one-on-one -on -one care and things like that. Um, and he's not actually that far away from the house he was living in. He's maybe about a 15 minute drive away. What's really interesting though, is that my grandfather seems to think that we moved him all the way to the other side of the state. And of course, you try to tell him you're only a few minutes away from your house, you're still in the same city you were living in, 
He doesn't believe it. And if he does believe it, he'll forget it in about five minutes. So disorientation is very much like this. Um, here's another example. Um, so in this case, um, they're not going to know what day it is. They're not going to know what month it is. Um, this particular patient will not know how old he is. Um, he doesn't know how the present moment he's in relates to the past. But in the case of this patient, JC, um, his language skills are intact and he can actually use clever tricks to basically avoid these questions. So... How long have you been on your own? Oh, have I got to go back about 3,000 years? When's your birthday? I forget. I wish you people had told me before I got here. Let me put it another way. What year were you born? Well, I wasn't very old at the time, so I didn't sort of get it. So he's not actually answering the question because he doesn't know, but he's deflecting a bit with humor. Now, this disorientation is likely due to hippocampal damage. Um, the hippocampus is really critical not only for memory, but as you might have read about in your textbook, we do know that there are um, areas in the hippocampus that are very responsive to spatial location. Um, and what we tend to find with a lot of these folks when they're disoriented, they get lost when they're walking out of the house, they don't know the day of the month, they don't necessarily know what year here it is, and so on. So what happens as the disease progresses? Um, one, what we are going to find is that there is this progressive retrograde memory loss. So generally, like I said, the memory loss tends to be last in, first out. So here's an example of what I mean by that. My grandmother really started showing um, mild to moderate symptoms of Alzheimer's disease in 2005. That was the same year that my oldest niece was born. My grandmother was around for that, and there are pictures of her holding the baby. My sister's next child was born in 2007. My grandmother was still alive and not doing terribly by any account. Um... But my grandmother very quickly did not remember who they were. Um, some of my younger cousins were born in the early to mid-90s. She soon began to lose the, her memory for them. Uh, and at some point, probably around 2009 to 2010, she forgot me. Um, and she still remembered my mother. She still remembered my grandfather because they had been together since they were in high school when they were teenagers, but she didn't remember me. Um, and so that's how it kind of works. As the brain continues to atrophy, remember that most of the long-term memories that you have are distributed throughout the cortex. Older memories are tougher because they've lasted longer. And so they take longer to atrophy compared to newer memories that are much more fragile. We will see semantic memory loss and inability to perform daily activities. My grandmother had to stop doing the laundry because she would keep forgetting that she had already done the laundry and she kept running the washer on the same set of clothes over and over and over again. Um, you will see a lot of wandering. There was a point when my grandmother was still mobile where she really couldn't seem to sit still. She was really very, very irritable and had mood swings. She pulled my hair one time. Um, additionally, they may have illusionary misidentifications. They may think that their granddaughter is actually their daughter, for example. Now, one thing that I will mention, um, and I want to be careful because I know I kind of mentioned that my grandmother died with Alzheimer's disease. Death is not usually a result of Alzheimer's disease. In the case of my grandmother, um, her heart failed. So she ba her heart basically gave out. Um, it's usually something external like a really bad cold, flu, pneumonia, an accident, or things like that. So we are done talking about um, moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease, the behavioral changes that we'll see. Next time we will talk about what's going on in the brain. See you then.